Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And um, we're going to uh, continue looking at uh, David H. Thiel's uh, critique of Lewis F. Weir's uh, critique of Ur Uriah Smith's understanding of Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence as we open your word together. We know, Lord, that um, you always have something prepared for us, something that um, can help us in our walk with you, that can enlighten our minds and bring us out of this dark world, and that can reveal to us uh, our sins and your power to overcome sin in our lives. We give our hearts to you and we ask that you can use us today. Um, we pray that uh, as we look at uh, the views of others, that we can understand how we form our own understanding and how faulty and frail we are as humans in our understanding of your word. But we pray, Lord, that we can obey the light that you give us, that we can walk in this path as we come closer to you each day. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. So we were, we're, we've were been dealing with David H. Steele's critique here, and uh, we're going to be dealing a bit with the idea of what the landmarks are, what this means, uh, where James White talks about removing the landmarks, and um, you'll see as the way that uh, Thiel addresses this, I'm not really happy with his his uh, his take on things, but we're going to look at it and and see what he has to say. Now, um, so this is that document. I do want to look at this document a little bit. I'm not sure if we'll do that today, but this this is um, the one that. Uh, Thiel is referring to. This is the, the earliest document of Lewis F. Weir's where he's going to address the King of the North at Jerusalem, saying that it's not, uh, you know, Turkey moving, it's uh, like taking over Jerusalem, uh, that this is referring to the papacy at the end of the world. And, and so we're going to look at this paper at some point, but for now we're going to be reading this. So we we read this already, White's earliest published view, 1847, which is the word to the little flock, may have been a reaction to what he saw as a dangerous practice implemented by Miller and Litch. So again, we point out that Thiel is doing some mind reading, which which I'm not really a fan of. I try not to do that with others. I definitely don't like when people do it with me. So he says here, uh, however, White appears to exaggerate the importance of his king of the north position in relation to his remark. Uh, positions taken upon the eastern question are based upon prophecies which have not yet their fulfillment. Here we should tread lightly and take positions carefully, lest we be found removing the landmarks fully established in the Advent movement. Then he, he muddies the water a bit here. He says, as at the time when White's health had been affected by overwork, he magnifies the papacy for the role of King of the North as though it were a landmark fully established before 1847. Only six years later, Nichols' view, being more consistent with Miller and Litch as presented before the Great Disappointment, proves the landmark less settled than White would have us believe. If Daniel 11 interpretations is what he even meant by landmark, as we are, appears to conclude. So, there's a lot of little nuance here. There's lots of little details. Now, when we think about our interactions with others, when we're having a discussion with someone we disagree with, it's really easy to, you know, pick up on things people say, to catch out a few words and respond to that rather than looking at the whole argument that a person has. Right. And we know that we can be emotionally attached to opinions and that uh, we can express things 
in ways that sometimes people react to and were surprised by because they're reacting to something we didn't say based upon uh, their understanding of our words. And sometimes there are words that are almost like triggers. An example I use of this, uh, once as I was doing a sermon in Beaumont, and uh, there was a couple that were really interested in what I was saying. I was doing a sermon on the nature of Christ, which I used to always do. Um, but I always took it from like, a different tack every time. And But they were quite absorbed in what I was saying. And, and I knew that they were from, they were visiting from a very liberal uh, Adventist church. And so I was fairly careful in how I was presenting things. I wanted, I didn't want to create any prejudice. But at one point near the end of the sermon, I, I used the phrase sinful human nature, referring to Christ's nature, which Ellen White uses. But for them, that was like a, a trigger. As soon as I said that, they looked at each other and then they looked down for the rest of the sermon. And shortly before, you know, the, the service ended, they left so that they didn't have to uh, talk to anyone, I guess. And, and I learned something from that. I mean, I've learned that, that there are words and phrases that people can use that can easily be misunderstood. And sometimes they've been, we've been biased towards them. Now, no, I say that because here in this, we, we'll call it a discussion between uh, Thiel and Weir, though Weir's not, and, and they're not discussing, but, but there's this literary sort of uh, discussion we're involved in with, with um, Lewis F. Weir's views and Thiel's. And it seems to me that Thiel is not really addressing what Weir is saying. He's picking up on certain things. Sometimes we could call it nitpicking, but he's, instead of looking at the whole argument, he's looking at, he's catching at things that Thiel is saying that he can then attack, right? So we, we have to be careful about that when we're discussing with people, because people, when they're presenting their views, are always going to have weaknesses in their presentation, right? Especially if they're not like here, obviously, Lewis F. Weir is not uh, responding to David H. Thiel, right? He's writing something in, in a certain context to certain people. And, and he's interpreting something James White has said, and he's applying it. And he could be wrong in how he's applying it. But it doesn't mean that his whole argument is wrong. Just because some things we may say are wrong to support what we believe, that we, we may be mistaken about some details or some facts, or we may misuse a verse, verse that doesn't really uh, fit, just because, you know, sometimes people will pick at those things, it doesn't mean that the whole argument is wrong, right? So we may have a view on something, but we may have have not thought about every detail of it, or we may have not had every part of it challenged, right? That's one of the reasons why I like to present things uh, that I've studied, present it to other people, and to see how they perceive it. And also, maybe people can correct some of my errors. But what, what we see Thiel doing, in my view, is picking at things. Instead of looking at the argument itself, he's taking things on the periphery of the argument as a way of attacking it. Now, sometimes we do that. We call it uh, a straw man argument. That is, we, we actually misrepresent something someone's saying. But sometimes we're actually, it's things the person is saying, but they're not really the central argument. They're not really the point that's being made. And so, you know, it's like the death by a thousand cuts or something like that. You can pick at all these other little things that are minor, but overall you, it can appear to destroy an argument. So that's kind of what I feel feel is doing here. Okay. So, so anyway, we're going to address this point of the landmarks of what this means. 
Um, and see, it wouldn't be to me a major argument of Louis F. Weir's, right? But, but this is where Thiel is going to set his attack here. Um, he says, Ellen White would, a decade later, address the dangers of resorting to the fear of removing landmarks when they really aren't landmarks. Now, this, of course, is in the context of 1888, right? And uh, so it's not in this context. He says, at the 1888 conference session, there existed a spirit of rejection that distorted the truth about fundamental beliefs making up the old landmarks. Now, I don't quite agree with him that that was really the issue. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll just leave it at that, see what he says here. So this is Ellen White's statement. There's a bracing of the mind and opposition of the soul brought to the investigation of the scriptures. This leaves such souls where Satan can impress them. In Minneapolis, God gave precious gems of truth to his people in new settings. This light from heaven by some was rejected with all the stubbornness the Jews manifested in rejecting Christ. And there was much talk about standing by the old landmarks. But there is evidence that they knew not what the old landmarks were. There was evidence and there was reasoning from the word that commended itself to the conscience. But the minds of men were fixed, sealed against the entrance of light because they had decided it was a dangerous error removing the old landmarks when it was not moving a peg of the old landmarks. But they had perverted idea of, ideas of what constituted the old landmarks. Now, in the context here, what what was it that uh, was perceived as being part of the old landmarks in 1888 that Jones and Wagner were removing? Does anybody know? We've done this study on the Friday night studies. What, what had, were the had, old? It had to do with the law in Galatians? Okay, so the law in Galatians. So now there are, there's actually two issues that people often bring out about 1888. One is there was a disagreement between uh, Uriah Smith and A.T. Jones regarding uh, what uh, tribes, what Germanic tribes uh, made up the 10 uh, divisions of, of Western Rome. And, um, and then the other one was the law in Galatians. Now, the problem there with the law in Galatians, as we studied on Fridays, was that uh, in our debates with Sunday keepers, um, who would often attack the Sabbath as part, you know, as the law that was done away, nailed to the cross, the argument that we used is that it was the ceremonial law that was nailed to the cross. And, of course, both are incorrect because no law is nailed to the cross in the Bible. Our sins, which are the transgression of the law, are nailed to the cross. And that's the moral law that it's a, tra they're, they're a transgression of, not the ceremonial law. But that's a whole other study. But um, that's in part what was dealt with the old landmarks. Because here we had some views, a way of studying scriptures, that um, people just said, well, that's removing the old landmarks. There's a comment uh, here. Angela says, as I looked at references for landmarks, it's clear that cursing ensued, curses ensued from removing violating hereditary landmarks as they would be removing spiritual landmarks, right? So the idea of a landmark is something that marks the land. You, and I don't know if you ever, you probably have seen them, but sometimes they're, uh, these little uh, brass discs, they have a long uh, pole that goes into the ground and they're surveying markers. I don't know if you've ever seen them. When I was lived in 100 Mile House, BC, right by the cabin where my son Matt was born, there was one just a few feet out from the front door off to the side. And uh, so that was a surveyor marking and, and it's illegal to remove them, right? So same in the Bible, land by removing a landmark, you could be uh, creating uh, a debate about, you know, what territory, does, what property is someone's property. So you have these landmarks. So now we use surveyor marking. So the idea of removing a landmark, God uh, 
It says there's a curse in doing so. Okay, so um, so the idea of what constitutes the landmark. So in this statement, she, Ellen White says, the passing of the time in 1844 was a period of great events opening to our astonished eyes, the cleansing of the sanctuary transpiring in heaven and having decided relation to God's people upon the earth. And also the first and second angels messages and the third unfurling the banner on which was inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. One of the landmarks under this message was the temple of God seen by his truth loving people in heaven and the ark containing the law of God. The light of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment flashed its strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. The non-immortality of the wicked is an old landmark. I can call to mind nothing more that can come under the head of the old landmarks. All this cry about changing the old landmarks is all imaginary. So here she's giving some examples of basically an outline of what the old landmarks are. And that wouldn't be an interpretation of Galatians, the law in Galatians, right? That's basically what she is trying to say here, that Jones and Wagner aren't removing any of these types of things. Now, generally, these are prophetic waymarks or landmarks, though we would say uh, the non-immortality of the wicked is, is not really a prophetic landmark. It's not an event or anything like that. But it is something that is a doctrine that is important because the Sabbath and the state of the dead are two uh, very important truths in conflict with uh, Sunday and the immortality of the soul, right? So I, I don't think that this is meant to be a complete comprehension comprehensive list of the landmarks it's sort of a, a general overview right so it's not like she's laying them out here are all of this different landmarks because some of these would include other details right obviously she's not mentioning the 2300 days she's not mentioning um you know the 1260 or the 1335 or or the 70 weeks or you know so obviously it is not a comprehensive list, but 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 it is it includes those things in its in its relationship, right? Now I would argue that the idea that the papacy is uh, the fourth kingdom of Bible prophecy, and that the removal of uh, the Pope, the capture of the Pope by birthday in 1798, is marking of the time of the end would be an old landmark, would it not? She doesn't explicitly say that, but the first, second, and third angels' messages and their times, yeah, would be connected to 1798. And and so I would say it is an old landmark. I would think it's actually uh, an important truth. And so I, I would agree with Louis F. Weir that, that James White is saying that when we uh, try to apply Turkey, that we are in danger of rejecting a landmark. But uh, Theo's going to have a different opinion on that. So he's going to say, well, if for a moment we were to give James White the benefit of the doubt that his cry about changing the old landmarks is not imaginary, then what would such a landmark look like? Let us suppose that the timing of the seven last plagues in relationship to the close of probation is an old landmark fully established by the Advent movement because of its connection to the sanctuary question as part of the list of old landmarks supplied by Ellen White in her 1889 statement. We can easily enough determine the correctness and accuracy of this landmark by a quick review of those who taught on the subject. So he's, he's going to say, if we want to understand what the old landmarks are, we need to go back to what was taught, okay? So that's going to be his his argument, what they taught on particular things. In 1853, Jay and Andrews wrote on this topic in a question-answer format at that time. So this would be the topic that he just mentioned here, dealing with the seven last plagues in connection with the close of probation. That's what I think he's referring to. 
At that time, James White served as editor while Joseph Bates, Joseph Baker, and Jan Anders formed the publishing committee. Uriah Smith was a contributor to this issue, having submitted a poem titled The Warning Voice of Time and Prophecy. We understand that the Savior, so this is from uh, Jane Andrews, we understand that the Savior ministered in the first apartment until the end of the 2300 days and that the termination of that period marked the commencement of his ministration in the holiest of all. If the ministration of the Savior in the first apartment had been on the principle of a day in a type, answering to a year in the antitype, then it would have occupied only 364 years instead of more than 1800. We know of no means of marking the precise length of Christ's ministration in the most holy place, but regard it as a brief period which will terminate human probation and end in the pouring out of God's wrath in the seven last plagues. Now, there's a whole bunch of things here which I want to look at that actually don't relate to our, our discussion here. But basically, what, what, is, uh, what is being addressed here by Jane Andrews? The time that Christ spent in the holy place, right? So he ministered in the first apartment until the end of the 2300 days. And then he's going to begin his work in the whole, most holy place or the holiest of all, he calls it here. If the ministration of the Savior in the first apartment had been on the principle of a day in the type, answering to a year in the antitype, then it would have occupied 364 years instead of more than 1800. Now, what what is he saying there? Is, do you understand what he, what he's saying? I just I just want people to be clear what what he's saying. So if we look at a a year of in in the Jewish cycle as a year, there's 364 days in a year, right? Or 365, I guess. And since one of those is the Day of Atonement, there'd be 364 years that Christ would have ministered in the holy place, right? Now, there's a bunch of other things regarding this. This actually brings up some interesting ideas, which we're not going to address here. But he says, we know of no means of marking uh, the precise length of Christ's ministry in the most holy place, but regarded as the brief period which will uh, terminate human probation and end in the pouring out of God's wrath in the seven last plagues. So so he's saying the, the holy place isn't based upon, you know, a day for a year, so to speak, that you're, because the, tw- the 2300 days, obviously, until, until the sanctuary is, is cleansed, um, and from the time of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection and the end of the 70 weeks, it's not going to be 364 uh, years that he's in the holy place. Okay. So he's saying we're not also don't know how long Christ is going to be in the most holy place. Right. But in regard to the brief period, which will terminate human probation and end in the pouring out of God's wrath in the seven last plagues. So he says you're going to have the close of probation and the pouring out of the seven last plagues. Now he says here, uh, two years later, Roswell F. Cottrell would contribute in affirming experience of which we will only deal with in part. The Lord is overruling all things for the good of his people and for the spread of the third message. The subject of the prophecies is being agitated. The spirit of inquiry is in the minds of the lovers of truth And it will not be satisfied with anything but the truth. It will not be hard to convince the candid that this government has something to do in the fulfillment of the prophecies that relate to the last days. That the vials of wrath containing the seven last plagues are the wrath without mixture threatened by the third angel. And consequently, not one of them can be poured out till mercy has ceased to plead and probation is ended. And then he says, James White's position did not differ from those expressed earlier. During the pouring out of the seven last plagues and the time of the shaking of the power of the heavens, a large portion of the wicked will doubtless be destroyed. A portion still remain to view scenes still more terrible and to endure anguish more dreadful. The sign is soon in heaven. The once slighted, insulted and crucified Savior, now King of Kings and Lord of Lords, is coming near the earth. His glory blazes everywhere. The saints hope and rejoice with trembling, but what an hour for the wicked. The tribes of the earth mourn. 
Amid the ruins of shivered creation, they hold one general prayer meeting. Kings and great men, rich men, chief captains and mighty men, free and bond, all, yes, all unite in the general wail. As the Son of Man and the glory of his Father, attended by all the holy angels, draws still nearer, consternation fills every breast. They hide in dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Their only hope is to be concealed from the glory of that scene. They know it is too late to pray for mercy, that probation for the human family has ended forever. Then he says, J. and Andrew's position remained unchanged in 1890. Now, the next event in the great day of God is the destruction of the living wicked by the seven last plagues. As these do not come until the wicked are accounted unworthy of the kingdom of God, their destruction comes as a part of the judgment work and after the virtual decision of their cases. The fact is many times revealed in the Bible that before the final deliverance of the saints, there comes a time of trouble such as never was. This is plainly marked as lying between the decision in the case of the righteous at the close of their probation and the event of their deliverance. So it is apparent that while Christ is finishing his work in the sanctuary, and while the third angel is giving the last message of mercy to man, the seven last plagues are withheld, though pending ready to be poured out. But when the work of probation is closed and the intercession of Christ in heaven and the voice of warning upon the earth are ended, then men drink from the cup of his indignation, the wine of God's wrath without mixture. Uriah Smith's position also remained unchanged from the time he first contributed to and then joined the publishing committee of the of the church paper he served as editor for so many years. So he's going to have the statement again, the chronology of the plagues, the description of this plague clearly reveals at once their chronology. For it is poured out upon those who have the mark of the beast and who worship his image, the identical work against which the third angel warns us. This is conclusive proof that these judgments are not poured out till after this angel closes his work. And that very class who hear his warning and reject it are the ones who receive the first drops from the overflowing vials of God's indignation. Consequently, these vials are not poured out till the close of the ministration of the in the tabernacle above, but immediately following that event. For Christ is then no longer a mediator. Mercy, which has long stayed the hand of vengeance, pleads no more. The servants of God are all sealed. What happens to this old landmark when we read the fanciful views contrived by a figurative hermeneutic? Lewis Weir places the seven last plagues as happening before the close of probation, claiming that the gathering of to Armageddon commences before the closing of probation. Uh, the decisions made before probation closes will determine whether or not we shall be destroyed in Armageddon. And by this reasoning alone promotes a figurative mystical rendering to a literal plain passage of scripture. Okay, we can con then conclude that an old landmark was removed by Weir since his position on the close of probation as it relates to the timing of the seven last plagues contradicts that of the pioneers as well as what Ellen White wrote in 1888 and 1911. Okay, so, <clears throat> so what has Thiel done here? Has he addressed the point in question? I don't believe so. No. Now, he also hasn't really shown that Lewis F. Weir teaches this, right? So, so he hasn't shown us what Lewis F. Weir has said other than saying in quotations, the gathering of Armageddon commences before probation closes. The decisions made before probation closes will determine whether or not we shall be destroyed in Armageddon. Now, and he says, by this reasoning alone promotes a figurative mystical rendering to a literal plain passage of scripture, which I don't think. <laughs> he like it. Like it. Right? How does he come? How does he come to that conclusion? What's that, Kelly? How does he come to that conclusion that we are saying that? Yeah, because I, I mean, I've read Lewis F. Weir. I don't think that's what he teaches. So, but even if he did. That wouldn't actually be addressing the point under discussion, right? That is, people can hold wrong views on the periphery of an argument that don't really relate to the argument itself. So if somebody comes along and points out some of my errors, you know, which I'm sure they can find some, 
would that address other things that I'm teaching that they didn't, that they just simply object to, but they haven't shown to be incorrect? Painting everything with the same brush. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, I mean, I don't take this statement that that he just quoted from Lewis F. Weir as as undoing any of what James White or Uriah Smith or um, Jan Andrews have said. Right. Obviously, the decisions made before probation closes will determine whether or not we shall be destroyed in Armageddon. That is obviously true. So he's he's going to say that the gathering together commences before the close of probation. Now, he's saying that that's a figurative, mystical rendering to a literal plain passage of scripture. Now, now that statement uh, for, is from Weir's uh, Bible Principles of Interpretation. Okay, so that's where he's going to quote that from. Now, and I do have that document, but I'm not going to look at that right at the moment. What I want to look at is the passage uh, in the scriptures that is really being discussed here. So I just learned something that I can make my Bible uh, text bigger than just by hitting the plus sign. So here we got the seven last plagues. I'll get rid of the Greek numbers. Now, so when we look at, at the plagues, it's going to be uh, the sixth plague. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Verse 15, uh, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So this is what Lewis F. Weir is referring to. This is the sixth plague. Now, is Lewis F. Weir saying that the sixth plague occurs before the close of probation in his statement? Is, is that what Lewis F. Weir said? He says the gathering together begins before the close of probation. But is he saying that the sixth plague begins before the close of probation? No, he is not. No, he's not, right? Now, he's just saying that there is decisions that are made prior to the close of probation that is part of that gathering together. So, but I think what Thiel is trying to do is to get Weir to say something that he's not saying, right? That he's saying, well, the plain statements here is that the gathering together occurs after the close of probation. But can we see that that the gathering begins earlier? Are the spirits of devils working miracles going forth to the kings of the whole world? Are those already working? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's a pro it's a process That's of uh, separation. Right. It's happening. Yeah. Choices. Now, in the sixth plague, we're going to see the three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, we know, of course, that is symbolic, right? It's not literal. We're not going to see unclean spirits looking like frogs coming out of the mouth of a dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. One is the dragon is a symbol. The beast is a symbol, and the false prophet is a symbol. So we would have to understand this as a symbol. We wouldn't take this in uh, its plain, literal rendering, right? Mixing uh, symbols and literal. Yeah, we are, we're understanding that this that that these are symbols. We wouldn't take. I, I'm not sure what he means by the plain meaning, right? By this reasoning alone, promotes a figurative mystical rendering to a literal plain passage of scripture is that is revelation 16 there versus whatever 9 to 16 are they literal plain passages what we just had read is that a literal plain passage of scripture when he gathers them to battle to the great day of god almighty right to the battle of armageddon 
Is that to be understood literally or figuratively? I would say figuratively. Yes, right? Now, Thiel seems to take the position that it's literal, that there is going to be a literal battle. I, I believe that's what he believes. I, I could be wrong, but that's what he seems to be saying in what I've I've seen. That is, is that, so, is that like referring to the Middle East uh, Mount of Megiddo or something like the Valley of Megiddo? <laughs> well, there there is no Mount of Megiddo. There is the Valley of Megiddo. So there's disagreement exactly how to interpret Armageddon, but but we often take it as as the mountain of Megiddo. So mountain becomes a symbol, but but there is no mountain of Megiddo. There's the valley of Megiddo. So so disagreements regarding that. But the point is, we are not looking for a literal battle of Armageddon, you know, involving. Uh, Israel and Turkey and, and all these different nations, right? Who Who is teaching that in the Christian world? Protestant evangelicals. Evangelicals. Protestant why, evangelicals. Do they, why do they teach that? What's, what's the basic premise under it? Because they think Israel is the... Um... Is it's the literal capital where the Jesus is coming back to? Well, yeah. Well, they they take Israel as still God's people, right? They they don't have, you know, that that liter that Israel has closed its probation, and that the gospel is moved to the Gentiles, and that it never moves back to Israel because what they believe is the gospel for a time goes to the Gentiles. And there's different views, but most of them have, there's going to be a secret rapture. And after the secret rapture, we're going to have all of this stuff, the battle of Armageddon, all these different things are going to happen. So the secret rapture has to happen before that. And, and then there's going to be uh, this opportunity for the Jews to be saved uh, before Christ returns. That's generally what evangelicals believe. There's lots of different views, but, you know, the idea that the time of trouble, that we're not going to go through it, that we're going to be raptured away is pretty common. Okay, so the reason why they are addressing these literal nations is because they're taking this literally. But we're not going to take Babylon literally. We're not going to take the dragon literally or the beast or the false prophet literally. Right. I mean, <laughs> That's what David H. Thiel is suggesting that we do, because we can't mix the literal and the figurative. We know the book of Revelation is written in symbolic language. It's figurative. Now, he likes throwing the word in mystical, right? Figurative, mystical. Why does he throw mystical in there? Is there anything mystical in, in, in using a figure? I mean, maybe in the sort of the strictest sense of it. But often when we use mystical, we just equate that with magical, things that aren't real, fanciful, right? Now, if David H. Thiel watches this video, he can correct me if I don't, don't understand his position correctly. But there's nothing mystical about saying that uh, the decisions made before probation closes will determine whether or not we shall be destroyed in Armageddon. And that that gathering to Armageddon must begin before the close of probation. Now, whether whether that's the best way to say it or not, I, I don't know if I would have said it that way, because it could open the door to a misunderstanding where somebody thinks that I'm saying the sixth plague happens before the close of probation. But definitely Louis F. Weir is not saying that. He doesn't have the plagues begin before the close of probation in anything that I've read. Maybe I wasn't looking for it. Maybe I didn't notice it. But anyway, we go on here. So he's claiming that this old landmark was removed by Weir. And then he's just going to quote Ellen White again, which Weir would agree with, and so do we. Uh, the severity of the retribution awaiting the transgressor may be judged by the Lord's reluctance, reluctance, reluctance to execute justice, the nation with which he bears long and would which he will not smite until it has filled up the measure of its iniquity in God's account, will finally drink the cup of wrath unmixed with mercy. 
When Christ ceases his intercession in the sanctuary, the unmingled wrath threatened against those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark will be poured out. The plagues upon Egypt, when God was about to deliver Israel, were similar in character to those more terrible and extensive judgments which are to fall upon the world just before the final deliverance of God's people. Terrible as these inflictions are, God's justice stands fully vindicated. These plagues are not universal, or the inhabitants of the earth would wholly be wholly cut off, yet they will be the most awful scourges that have ever been known to mortals. All the judgments upon men prior to the close of probation have been mingled with mercy. The pleading blood of Christ has shielded the sinner from receiving the full measure of his guilt. But in the final judgment, wrath is poured out, unmixed with mercy. In that day, multitudes will desire the shelter of God's mercy, which they have so long despised. While James White accused Smith of neglecting present light for a greater future light, he was falling back upon the conclusions of Martin Luther for identifying the king of the north, thereby effectually relying upon a dimmer light from the past than that of the present light. Uh, uh, the great and solemn events which we must know as we stand in the very threshold of their fulfillment. Now, so what, what Thiel is saying here is that James White was falling back upon the conclusions of Martin Luther for identifying the king of the north as the papacy uh, and saying that that's a dimmer light from the past than that of the present life, the present light, which Uriah Smith presented. Does this seem like a very fair statement? No. No. I mean, if if... <laughs> If you were to do this with many other truths that we believe, that other people believed prior to Adventism, prior to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, would we dismiss it as relying upon a dimmer light just because it's from the past? I was going to ask the question. Okay. What's your question, William? Is, uh, is he saying that, that this mercy begs after the close of probation. There's no mercy after the close of probation. It's unmixed. The wrath of God is unmixed with with. The quote you read. The quote you read was it? Was he was he saying that it was closed? It, mercy was mixed for probation after probation closes. After probation closes, there's no more mercy. That's, I know. That. Yeah, that's, 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 that's what I read. I didn't read anything different than that. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Nobody said anything different. Okay. It's the word prior, William, prior to the close of probation, have been mingled with mercy. Yeah, prior to the, prior to the close of probation, have been mingled with mercy. The judgments upon men, yeah. But after the close of probation, it's going to be unmixed with mercy. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Yeah. So getting back to Theo's statement here, I mean, this is, you know, and, and, and we don't look at these things to try to tear down somebody else and build ourselves up. That's not the purpose of looking at this. We're supposed to be looking at ourselves, right? So, It'd be easy just to say, well, you know, we're better than Edwin Field because we don't do things like this. But I'm sure that we do in our arguments. At times, we misunderstand one another. We misrepresent. We present things in a way that's um, either emotionally charged or has a polemical uh, language, rhetorical language that is going to create bias, going to manipulate the person that we're communicating with. And th just these types of things really don't make sense to do. So James White did not accuse Smith of neglecting present light for a future greater light. For one thing, it's not what he was saying. He was just saying, you what, need what's to the, what? what's the quote? What is the quote, uh, Ellen White about lesser light, greater light? Um, well, I, I, well, she says lots of different statements about lesser light. I mean, I always think more about the statement about new light and old light, that new light is an unfolding of, of established truths of old light, right? Yeah, yeah. Pastor, I know. 
uh, agree with so, old white. Yeah, so James White, what he is saying to Smith is that you're dealing with, with Turkey as, as the kingdom in Daniel 11 at, in the final verses. But we understand that the papacy is this power. Right? We can look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we can see that the description of that basically Paul is quoting uh, Daniel 11, verse 36, as far as I'm concerned, uh, when it comes to the man of sin. Right, that That's the closest of all the different passages in Daniel that um, Paul would be quoting, you know, the man of sin is is you know the, he exalts himself and above everything that is called god or that is worshiped right so that he is god sitteth in the temple of god showing himself that he is god if you read that passage in daniel 11 verse 36 and onwards it's describing the same details different words one is we have the book of of um uh uh, uh Second Thessalonians, we have it in Greek, right? So, I mean, obviously, Hebrew and Greek can translate different into English. So, so there's not, it's, you know, it's not a direct translation, but it definitely is an allusion to that passage more than any other passage in Daniel or any other place in the Old Testament. So, so that's all James White is saying. He's saying that you're, you're dealing with unfulfilled prophecy and it makes more sense to apply it to the papacy. He didn't accuse Smith of neglecting present light. He said that he needed to be cautious lest he was removing the landmarks, right? Now, when it comes to greater future light, we know that new light is an unfolding of old light. That is, it doesn't undo established truths. And the question is, is it an established truth that um, the papacy is the final kingdom? Right. Well, Rome is right. And, and it, and we know that it, it, uh, there's more details given because we're going to see, of course, the United States is going to, the papacy is going to receive a deadly wound. The United States is the days of one king. It's that, that period of time in which, um, Tyre is, uh, not going to be, uh, selling its wares. And then at the end of the 70, Years, the days of one king, Tyre will sing like a harlot. And of course, that's what's going to happen. That's the resurrection of the papacy. So we have lots of different scriptures giving us these truths. What does the, what does the phrase days of one king mean? Okay. So that is from Isaiah. And it's going to talk about the 70 years. Um, that's going to be the period of time that Babylon is going to be it's, it's Isaiah 23, verse 15. So what's going to happen is this is um, uh, an oracle concerning Tyre and Sidon, right? Tyre is the economic power in the Levant, in the Middle East. And um, when Babylon takes over the Middle East, Tyre is going to be forgotten for 70 years, according to the days of one king, right? So that's just just a period of a time of of a kingdom, right? We're okay. going to call that yeah, to the United it's, States because it's, during it's the time, not a, it's not an actual king; it's a kingdom. Yes, it's not an actual uh, king. Yeah. After the end of seventy years, shall Tyre sing as an harlot, right? So, so that seventy year period is the period in which Babylon from six oh nine. Um, BC to 539 BC, the Neo Babylonian Empire has control over the Levant. And we apply that to the death of the papacy. Tyre is going to symbolize the papacy in 1798. And so Babylon then becomes a symbol in this context of the United States. So the United States is taking this position of the, the days of one king, the 70 years. That's how we've applied it. So at the end of that time, the papacy will rise again, right? Its deadly wound will be healed. 
but the but the point is, you know, that we're looking at here is we're, we're addressing how we look at new light. So new light should make old light shine brighter. Now we're going to be dealing with some of Ellen White's statements in this in these studies as we go through this paper regarding the Eastern question and Uriah Smith. So I've dealt with these in discussions with people before. And, and so there are some things that we have to address that, that he's going to address, but you can see how he sets these things up. Um, it's not really what I would call a fair way of looking at an argument. And we will look at Lewis F. Weir's paper as well at some point. Okay, so he says, even more importantly, the assumption is presented in such a manner that James appears to take for granted this threshold as though there can be no importance placed upon the perspective that positions held regarding the papacy as the king of the north are also based upon prophecies which have not yet their fulfillment and subsequently are just as predisposed to take on the aura of strain in the field of fancy. Now, simply he's saying, well, since these things are not fulfilled, we can't even we can't even take things regarding the papacy at all, right? Now, that's not what James White is is presenting, right? Because he's saying we have all of these other lines of prophecy that address the papacy and the Sunday law and the United States and all those things. That's what we should focus upon. So his 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 argument here is really not a fair argument because he says, in other words, those who hold to the papal position are just as prone to fanciful interpretations as and predictions as those who held to the turkey position when it comes to painting any picture as to how prophecy may further develop. Now, of course, that's true of, of anything. People can have fanciful interpretations, but that's not what James White is saying. He's saying we need to move slowly based upon what we understand in the past, how we understand these truths, and only as we see them unfolding will we understand them fully, right? The conservative caution penned by White needs to be applied to both parties, which James White would apply, it, and so does Lewis F. Weir. He says, yet Lewis F. Weir's principles of interpretation consisting of double and triple applications create a great deal of permissiveness in the latitude of interpretations that appear fanciful, considering the figurative approach in making a symbolic allegory of everything. Now, that is not a fair representation of Lewis F. Weir's principles of interpretation. By having double and triple applications, does that create a great deal of permissiveness or does it actually put more constraint upon our interpretations? You understand what I'm saying? Let me ask you. I, I would say uh, more constraint because all three dots have to line up. Yes. When we do line upon line, when we look at reform lines, <laughs> And we see the pattern of the structure of these reform lines. And we see, you know, we can look at any way mark and we can see the same a reform line, the same structure exist in every history. This puts a constraint. It actually inhibits fanciful interpretations. Now, true, people can misuse things. When, when Colin was doing his presentations regarding what was going to happen with Donald Trump, we could see that one of the problems is that he didn't have it on a proper line. He was noticing dates, but the structure that he had uh, didn't align with a, a, a reform line, right? So he wasn't able to interpret what these dates and structures meant. And we were able, as we went through the book of Judges, to show that those dates were correct, but the interpretation was wrong because he didn't fully understand the structures of these reform lines. So this book of Judges gave us the structure of these reform lines within this movement and clearly helped us interpret and distinguish what was truth and what was error. Now I know it was rather complicated. Not everybody fully understood all of those things, but the movement had an opportunity to go to the camp meeting, to go through these studies and understand the structures. But there was a resistance to it for all kinds of different reasons, personal reasons and 
biases, and party spirit, and all kinds of things like that. But these were all shown in the lines themselves. So we could see clearly that the predictions that were being made would not occur because they weren't following these principles. So there is a constraint when we understand these applications of prophecy. It doesn't open the door to all kinds of interpretations. Right now, and and I don't know, you know, with Thiel, the way that he writes here, um, yet Lewis Weir's principles of interpretation consisting of double and triple applications create a de- great deal of permissiveness in the latitude of interpretations. Then he says that appear fanciful, right? Which that is true. They can appear fancif- fanciful. Doesn't mean they are, right? Somebody looking at what we present could think it's fanciful. But also, I don't what? think that that Weir is using, making a symbolic allegory of everything. Okay, Kelly? Like, like, why would people draw that conclusion that it's fanciful? I'm sorry. Because well, they don't understand it. it it's involved, okay. right? Mm. Yeah. It's complicated, it, it, but it, simple. Yeah, there, there's an underlying consistency and simplicity to it, but it's very involved. There's lots of details. And so, you know, but the fact that he put the word appear fanciful, it kind of undermines what he's saying, because just because something appears fanciful doesn't mean that it is. Now, he probably means that they appear fanciful to him, and so they are fanciful, right? But but also, I don't think that that Weir is using a symbolic allegory of everything, a figurative approach in making a symbolic allegory of everything. I, I don't think that that's what Weir is doing. And it's not what we're doing, but people can can um, sort of dismiss it as that. Now, in, in a way, there are symbols, right? Numbers are symbols. Dates are symbols. Uh, way marks are symbolic. There is lots of symbolic language in the Bible. There's lots of symbols that God gives us in his word. And in a sense, an allegory you know, that's just a comparison of something. So you you could argue, well, yeah, he's making a symbolic allegory of everything. But it's, and, and you can say it's figurative. It's in, it's in types, it's in symbols. It's kind of rep- repetitive what he's saying here. But we know that that's what the Bible does. If we're going to say, well, we only understand the Bible in its plain statements that we must take everything literally as it's written, we wouldn't be Seventh-day Adventists. We would have to take the 2,300 days as 2,300 days. Right? I would I would say, yeah, we wouldn't be Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, the other way I'd say it is, we would be as children. Well, in, in a bad sim, sim, Simple, yeah. Si, yeah. Like yeah. children are really simplistic in their understanding. Yeah. So, so I... I don't know. I, I'm I'm puzzled a bit by this. So he says, uh, Thiel says, um, no doubt some fanciful extrapolation occurred as Bible prophecy was forced into the reading of current events reported in the newspapers of the time period. One can safely conclude that the practice continues by both parties, even as we look for validation of positions currently held by our contemporaries in making event events placeholders in the juxtaposition of prophecy and history. That is the rise of atheism, communism, the number of Roman Catholics in the United States Supreme Court, and the need for the an ambassador to be appointed to the Vatican. It is indeed a more delicate matter to contrive the fulfillment of prophecy and current events of the freshly baked history than the rest than to rest upon the older lows of history where time is more surely vindicated and establish the truthfulness Uh, of our conclusions, but we must also recognize that events are more rapidly communicated today or easily vetted because of digitization of books into computerized libraries and the ease in which we can then blog our conclusion via internet connections that are ever increasing in the speed by which news, genuine, alternative, and fake alike is conveyed. In all fairness, 
it is just as easy for those promoting the papacy as the king of the north to stray and mislead as any accused holding contrary beliefs. We need to carefully scrutinize how white and weir are guilty of doing the very same thing, even as they selected the history that suited their conclusions and reasoned with an argumentative logic for the purpose of casting doubt on what Uriah Smith, A.T. Jones, J.M. Loughborough, and A.G. Daniels, who were actively preaching with one voice regarding the Eastern question, and that Ellen White plainly stated is truth. Now, we're going to have to look at that statement. Uh, the scrutiny that must include the rules for interpreting, the pro interpreting prophecy in scripture. Lewis Weir has established for himself a reputation for hermeneutics, given the rules he has laid out in his booklet as accepted by his adherents. Even uh, partially uh, quotes what Ellen White wrote in the great controversy about the process William Miller used in his own methods of Bible study and interpretation. And he uses a form of hermeneutics, giving his rules power, which might supersede a certain principle or more, of interpretation used by William Miller regarding the decision to treat a word or combination of words literally or symbolically. He provides proofs from the scriptures and spirit of prophecy, making them lend authority to, in support of his interpretations. But for the sake of space, we will list the rules alone, and then we can more easily compare them with the rules used by Miller, Himes, and Litch to determine their reliability. Okay, so we're going to have to take a little bit of time with this. Let's see if I can find this document. No, that's not what I want. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to have to find that document. don't know where it is. Uh, <clears throat> well, let's, let's deal with what he says here first. We'll probably look at that tomorrow or not. What day is it? Today was Wednesday. Yeah, so tomorrow. Okay, the interpretation must reveal Christ. Compare scripture with scripture for clearer light. The things of Israel now belong to the church. The gospel is in every passage and prophecy. The law of growth or development, the principle of repeat and enlarge, the repetition contains an explanation. Thus, the book of Revelation throws light upon all the preceding books and must itself be interpreted with remembrance of all the books that have preceded it. Some have not done this and have consistently misinterpreted some of its important principles or important prophecies. Uh, principle six, the law of worldwide symbolized by the local. All the prophets employed the principle of the worldwide symbolized by the local. Principle seven, the law of the significance of Bible names. A decided connection exists between the proper names of the Bible and its history and doctrines. Principle eight, the law governing spiritual interpretations. God is the author of spiritual interpretations. It is a mistake to think that spiritual interpretations take one into an unreal world, a world of fancy, conjecture, imagination, where they take one into a world of actuality. They are mental pictures of spiritual truths which are based upon things that have actually happened. In principle nine, observe the deep inner meaning, not alone what is on the surface. However, the deeper meaning is not to be obtained uh, by some fanciful interpretation that is not necessary. For somewhere in God's word will be found the key of explanation. Principle 10, the design of the book of Revelation. All the laws of interpretation show that the gathering of the nations to Armageddon must commence before probation closes. There are other laws of interpretation, which leads us to the same conclusion. Um, and it is a corollary drawn from this fact that emphasizes the solemn truth that the gathering of Arm Armageddon precedes the sixth plague, obviously. Uh, principle 11, New Testament principles determine the interpretation of the late, latter portion of Daniel 11. And we would agree with that, right? So obviously, um, we're not going to interpret Daniel, the latter portion of Daniel 11, literally, because the New Testament has already applied those symbols and other places um, to in, in a symbolic way to worldwide powers. Principle 12, double and triple applications of prophecy, rightly dividing the word of truth. Of course, it's not explained here. And the principle of triple application revealed in the apocalypse. With the outlay of principles for prophetic interpretation, we can better understand Lewis F. Weir's attitude towards Uriah Smith, going so far as to pronounce Smith's rules of hermeneutics to be arbitrary and superficial in nature and leading to the pronouncement false prophet 
We should also note that the Bible laws of interpretation here mentioned are those established by Lewis F. Weir with the proofs selected from Ellen White's writings. There are definite laws of interpretation. So this is the King of the North at Jerusalem, this paper that I have open uh, here. It's going to be from page three and four of this paper. Um, <clears throat> There are definite laws of interpretation. When they are employed consistently, anyone may understand prophecies pertaining to the future. But Uriah Smith, in arbitrarily deciding that Turkey was the king of the north, did not employ Bible laws of interpretation. He merely took a human superficial view, which is what we saw. In the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Zechariah, Babylon is said to be north of the kingdom of Babylon, the king of the north, and the king of the Babylon, the king of the north. So Ezekiel 26, 7, Jeremiah 25, 9, etc. Had Uriah Smith permitted the Bible to explain itself, he would not have blundered in his interpretation concerning the king of the north, and there would have been no need for James White to utter the sound caution he gave to prevent Uriah Smith and others from becoming false prophets. Ever since Uriah Smith introduced this interpretation into our midst, it has been a most fruitful source of false prognostications because it is not the true interpretation of the word of God. So of course, we're on a much different page than, than um, David H. Thiel is. So we can see that Uriah Smith's interpretation to apply all of Daniel 11 literally is inconsistent with the New Testament and another passages of scripture that show that we must apply Babylon at the end of the world and the king of the north at the end of the world to what is called spiritually Babylon. To apply it to Turkey that is never Babylon in that context, right? Okay. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, how would we deal with, you know, if, if we had David H. Steele here, David, um, here, how how would we have this discussion? What what would we do to show him that that this that that Smith is making an error in applying Turkey? What what would be the the strongest way that we could do this? I mean, we brought up lots of different points. I don't know. Could we convince him? Is there something that we could present? Well, let's go on and read what he says here. Because of the objections Lewis Weir raises concerning Uriah Smith's approach to prophetic interpretation, we're compelled to spend some time understanding the differences between Weir's and Smith's principles of interpretation. Truly, Smith relied upon the same rules of interpretation as used by William Miller and accepted by many Protestants at the time of the Millerite movement. Is this true? I mean, there's two statements here. First is, did Smith rely upon the same rules of interpretation as used by William Miller? Repeat that question, please. He says here, Smith relied upon the same rules of interpretation as used by William Miller. Would we agree with that part of his statement? No, we would not. No, because we've shown where he departs from Miller many, many places. And would we say that William Miller's rules of interpretation were accepted by many Protestants at the time of the Millerite movement? No, they were not. No, right? Definitely not, right? So part of the problem that Thiel has here is that he believes that Protestants actually understood William Miller's rules of prophetic interpretation. And they didn't. They didn't use them. What is the basic rule that Protestants are using at the time of William Miller? that Smith uses, that we've noted. Smith does this all the time. And that's one of the reasons why he, he, he sticks so closely to the pioneers as well. He takes man as an authority, right? He quotes commentaries, dictionaries, right? As the authority for lexicons. Now, you know, a lexicon is a useful tool. Could, could we, could we just, Yesenius is lexicons useful, but one of the we, things that a lexicon does. It, is, what's that? Could we could we say it interpretation by headlines? Well, not not so much that. That's not 
yeah, that that's part of what happens. But I would think that Smith, what he does is he relies not upon the the scriptures as much upon people's commentaries, opinions about things, right? So that's what we see him doing. And and there's nothing wrong with quoting somebody. If somebody gives a good argument, a good biblical argument, you can quote him and use his words to present the argument. But Smith will often just say, well, this person says this, so obviously it is correct because this person is an authority, right? So the appeal to authority, and, and there's nothing wrong with the appeal to authority when somebody's, you know, their their authority is 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 established on something, right? There are people that that are authorities. It's not it's not a logical fallacy to to use authorities, but Smith will use authorities without any evaluation of whether what they're saying is true or not, right? He, he's not going to present the argument. He's just going to pick and choose things that agree with him. I think the quote I put in the chat there would be timely here because yeah, that's what they're yeah, doing. yeah, yeah. Read okay, it for us. yeah. So caution concerning unfulfilled prophecy. White gave wholesome counsel against attempting to prophesy or prognosticate on unfulfilled prophecy before it comes to pass. This was particularly true of the Eastern question. He later wrote, but in exposition of unfulfilled prophecy, where history is not written. The student should put forth his propositions with not too much positiveness, lest he find himself strained in the field of fancy. Now, it's quoted from the prophetic faith of our fathers, which is by... Um, I found that phrase interesting. That's why I looked it up, a strain in the field of fancy. I wondered who used it. <laughs> yeah. St strain from the field of, in the field of fancy. So Uriah Smith is, is not really generally a speculative person. Right. So he, he tends to to present what he considers to be the pioneer position on things. But there are areas in which he made some predictions. But because he wasn't well founded, it is he didn't fully understand the truths he was presenting. He presented some things that didn't come to pass. They were speculative. James White gave counsel regarding that. Now, we're going to have some statements in the spirit of prophecy about the Eastern question that uh, Thiel is going to take as an endorsement of it, right? But, uh, you know, it's not something that I would agree with. So anyway, essentially every hermeneutical objection where we are leave levies against Smith ought to be understood by us as being levied, levied against Miller, and I would disagree. So that's not true. Furthermore, in calling Uriah Smith, A.T. Jones, J.N. Lofro, and A.N. Jan Daniels false prophets, which he's not doing, <laughs> he implies that Ellen White is also a false prophet, which he's not doing, for she certainly does call the teaching of the King of the North as Turkey truth and prayed that God would make the truth plain to others. The irony is that at the time she made this diary entry, she was living in Australia, and it was to Aussies that Elder Daniels preached a message Weir declares to be patently false. So we're going to have to look at this claim. Okay. Weir seems to have forgotten that as God's mercy was extended to the population of Nineveh, the unfulfilled message of doom did not make Jonah a false prophet when the city was not destroyed at the end of, of 40 days. Nor does his claim that Smith was arbitrary in his hermeneutics have any foundation whatsoever. If Smith was arbitrary, then so were Mir, or Miller, Litch, and Clark. Okay, simply by looking over the list of 14 rules along with the proof texts, we can see that William Miller was not arbitrary in his prophetic interpretation when he wrote a list of 14 rules of Bible interpretation along with the proof texts. By special request, he had given them to the public so that all who wish to understand the Bible might benefit by the consistent use of these principles. For the sake of space, again, only the rules would be supplied here along with Miller's preamble. Now, Miller's rules are correct. Did Miller always follow his own rules? I would think yes, except for the the point that he chose to place the coming of Christ against direct spirit or direct scriptural admonition. Okay. 
it, it, well, right. So there's direct prophecies telling us that we can't know the day or the hour of Christ's return. That these things are hidden from us. But, but we also know that he made the sanctuary to be cleansed to be the earth. Is there a biblical uh, support for that in any way? Did Miller just make an assumption without checking? I don't know that I could answer that. Well, he did. He just made the assumption. It's not something he establishes line upon line to demonstrate that the earth is the sanctuary. He just assumes it. So just because we believe in a set of rules doesn't mean that we always follow them consistently. Right? And I've seen which, many, many times. Which, which, rule was, which rule did he violate? Well, he didn't compare all the scriptures. Okay. Right? Because the scriptures show that the earth, there's no scripture that shows the earth is the sanctuary that's to be cleansed. Now, he, he took the word cleansed by fire, that the earth is going to be cleansed by fire. So you could say, well, he took the word cleansed and the earth is going to be cleansed. But there was no way to support the idea that the earth was the sanctuary to be cleansed. And that the being cleansed by fire just totally ignored what the cleansing of the sanctuary was about. Right. So there are things just because because we're limited people. That seems like a pretty simple thing to figure out. Like, because there is no nothing in the sanctuary where it's cleansed by fire. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And and then of course you know he's sort of ignoring you know Christ's priestly ministry and all those types of things. But. In some ways, that's forgivable. It wasn't something generally understood at the time. Still is not something generally understood. And, and so, so just because we have a set of rules doesn't mean that we always apply them, right? So the problem is not that Miller had the wrong rules. That's not what Lewis F. Weir even is suggesting. That sometimes, or that Smith didn't understand Miller's rules. He's just saying that he doesn't apply them correctly. And that's a much different thing because Lewis F. Weir's rules don't contradict with Miller's rules. There's nothing there that contradicts. Right? I've looked at, at Miller's rules in, in fine detail. I've looked at uh, Weir's rules in fine detail. And, and we don't find a conflict between them. Now, in some ways, there is maybe an expansion of Miller's rules in in Weir's. We have an expansion when we understand line upon line, not to be just scriptures, but to deal with reform lines. That's an expansion of Miller's rules, but it's consistent because that rule comes from the scriptures itself. So anyway, our time is almost up here. So looking at Miller's rules, um, we've gone through them before, all the 14 rules, which my the most important rule is the 14th one. Um, that is, you must have faith. It must be a faith that requires a sacrifice. And if tried, would give up the dearest object on earth, the world and all its desires. Character, living, occupation, friends, home, comforts and worldly honors. If any of these should hinder our believing any part of God's word, it would show our faith to be vain. Nor can we ever believe so long as one of these motives lies lurking in our hearts. We must believe that God will never forfeit his word. And we can have confidence that he that takes notice of the sparrow, numbers the hairs of our head, will guard the translation of his word and throw a barrier around it and prevent those who sincerely trust in God and put implicit confidence in his word from erring far from the truth, though they may not understand Hebrew or Greek. Right? So this, this part of faith, this is the part that's sort of the intangible. No matter how many rules you have or try to follow, there is this personal experience that helps us understand God's word. And, and that means that the study of God's word is about a transformation of character, right? It's not just an intellectual exercise. It's not really about a methodology or a hermeneutic. Right. right. This is a mistake that people make. Are we going to be changed by God's word as we read it? That's the most important thing. 
Okay. Well, we'll come back to this tomorrow, but let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this morning. I bless, pray that you can bless each person, be with them, help us in our day-to-day struggle. We know that you are, are teaching us, and some of these lessons are hard to learn. We pray for David H. Thiel, his family, and we pray for one another. We ask, Lord, that we can represent you in, in our characters and that we can be an influence for good. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.